Na jó. Good evening all on playchess.com and also streaming to YouTube. I thought this week we could again interrupt the Fisher Spesky match. There's another brilliant tournament that has just finished where there was a fantastic immortal game played by one of the players, Wei E. But uh, it, it caused me some interest in the tournament generally and who won it, which which was actually the player Wang Yu, uh, who was 2716 at the start of this tournament. And if you look at the FIDE rating list, uh, he's had the most uh, increased rating points, I think, for the top 30. If you look at 2700 chess, the live site. So he's been making great strides uh, for his rating. Wang Yu. So he he really tamed a lot of the dynamic aggressive players, and you know with very positional chess. Actually, some have described it as almost like Petrosian like. So I thought it'd be interesting to check out these games. Uh, so th the first game. So there's five key games I want to look at. Uh, this might take more than an hour, but there's five key games I want to, in principle, look at. Um, I'll try and avoid some of the technical issue uh, last week. We're going to use just standard Fritz, which I'm hoping, rather than Stockfish, which I'm hoping won't explode during uh, analysis <laughs> like last week, which caused some issues. So I'm hoping it's going to be a bit smoother. So that should be good enough as the analytical assistant, uh, Fritz. And um, I think it'll be more stable. So um, when you against Liu Shanglei, let's have a look at this game first. C4. I'm hoping the board is okay everywhere. So we have C4 from Wang Yu, the English opening. We have C6, so a solid response from Black. And we have G3 here, D5. Bishop G2. And Black's play is entirely logical looking to get the bishop outside of the pawn chain first for e6 the slight downside that b7 is tapped into straight away though white plays queen b3 actually is just check i'm going to just check with live book this is actually quite a rare move in live book c takes is quite common about 400 games or casting or b3 so this is slightly off beat 52 games but still it's been played before queen b6 now d d3 and black plays e6 so both sides are not keen to double each other's pawns there's enough dynamic potential of of, of the rook or or, or or reverse until it seems now bishop e3 black is really prompted to do something with the queen does he really want to retreat it or is he really going to take on b3 now okay let's have a look here if if he retreats it Let's have a quick look. It doesn't really help black, even though the position seems to be quite closed. I think white will be having some pressure soon. This, this should be this should be a very comfortable position for white. Uh, just generally speaking, it's, it's losing development. So black actually did take on b3 with a takes. So if black can make use of that b4 square, suppress the a file pressure, it would seem uh, potentially quite nice. And sometimes these pawns can be vulnerable. We have a6 trying to suppress the a file in advance. Knight c3. h6 is played here. And then we have c takes d5. e takes d5. Now, in this position, if you look at it uh, structurally, yes, white looks like a wreck on the queen side. Why would you want to do this? As well as c takes it makes the double pawns look even worse to play c takes this is really a stranded island of two pawns there's a subtle uh, bit of compensation here i would say it's it's the dark square complex you see all these pawns on light squares what about these dark squares and in particular i think the most exploitable dark square in this position which you'll see in this game used quite a lot is this c5 one c5 
pay a spe a special attention to the c5 square as well as the d4 square they these are slightly more vulnerable than usual in this setup knight d4 hitting the bishop of which of course it can go back now black prepared for that and it looks as though this is going to be dangerous you know with d4 so the knight gets out of the way controlling c5 potentially if b4 is played because the knight actually supports b4 which helps control c5 why would white want to have a dark square grip on c5 well it's on the semi-open file so this is definitely a key strategic square in the position the c5 square we see knight bd7 and now b4 white clamping down on that c5 square now does this look harmless to everyone here is this a sort of plan you'd ever play you you'd have splintered pawns and you try and control c5 does this look too polite i'm, I'm going to ask you a strange qu question does this look too soft a plan to most people watching this stream because i think this is interesting positionally this whole thing so far it is interesting positionally that white has diced his pawns and is content with c5 control what do you think about this this bishop is also if you look at it is not doing too much on the diagonal this structure is quite good against that bishop the knights don't seem to have too many squares in the position but it's not like hyper aggressive chess is it why, why just control the c5 square what advantage can this bring one advantage potentially if you perch a knight on c5 you might be encouraging the undoubling of pawns and that could be useful later and on top of that imagine if you have a pawn here and you get a knight later to d4 how good would that knight be on d4 i think it would be pretty good a knight on d4 strategically if you visualize the impact uh, of that sort of thing so you have a pawn here and a knight here this would be against like a bad bishop uh, it will be like a, a very well perched knight so just bear this in mind this dark square strategy is fairly ruthless actually it's it's pretty ruthless looking because it's actually difficult for black to do much about it he's made a commitment with his pawns on knight squares here and white is exploiting that commitment this structure in fact but the double pawns are playing a pivotal role here it's almost like um there's this classic Capablanca game where he undoubles his pawns and, and, and is much better. Um, it's a little bit like that. Let's see. Rook c8, knight a4, looking at c5 and b6. Bishop d6. And now knight c5, encouraging black to be tempted to take. The knight sits comfortably, can't kick because of the a6 pawn. The structure is under pressure. We see rook c7. And now another pressure move bishop a3 exerting even more pressure with this knight black castles and the white king just strides to d2 wants to be close to the center rook e8 and now putting pressure on the other knight look at the amount of pressure on black's position here it's quite a lot and that d4 square in particular seems very very nice for white on top of the c5 square the dark square strategy so far is beautiful with the double pawns it's absolutely beautiful knight f8 maybe trying to challenge things the, the knights are not doing much f4 another another move controlling another dark square e5 helping control e5 here knight e6 trying to challenge these perched pieces white takes f takes and now this is an opportunity to get rid of the dark square defender bishop c5 and as i say what where does this all lead if you get a fantastic knight on d4 that is something if, it, if it's an irreproachable knight on d4 this is this can represent a nice positional advantage what is black doing here he takes undoubling white's pawns that seems unfortunate but what does black do instead 
He can't move the rook to the fens. E6 will drop, right? If he plays this, it's it's it looks a bit dangerous. Knight D4. It still looks dangerous. What to control uh, here? White's White's pretty comfortable here. So yeah, maybe this this maybe the better move was indeed rook <clears throat> d7 here maybe black has faltered a little bit the engine suggests rook d7 but yeah he takes undoubling white's pawns but is this enough to really win a game of chess having a nice knight on d4 versus this bishop here which is blunted and this bishop here which is quite nice it's got a target is that really enough to win a game of chess at this level black tries to liberate his position giving some play it seems in theory on the e-file knight d4 white has achieved his strategic goals effortlessly minimal tactics so you know what tactical counterplay had that has there been in this game white's got a very very nice perched knight and this is this is like a, a minority of pawns strangling well suffocating a majority of pawns like the mobility of the, the queen side is severely limited we see rook c e7 and now we see rook a4 giving the possibility of rook b4 to put pressure on b7 g5 it weakens f6 this is probably quite a significant weakening move in fact maybe black if he sits tight though you know white's going to start torturing black uh, a little bit more maybe puts more pressure on the f file and it's just a very very comfortable position so black lashed out again creating some weaknesses rook f1 the knight moves and now white gives up his bishop he just wants the knight versus the bishop this is like a complicated uh, maths formula being simplified down from the opening the knight is now against the bishop here after bishop takes rook takes is this a strategic win so that's my question to you is white strategically winning after all this is, is white strategically winning here i'll, I'll, I'll type the question on stream what do you guys think if I give you 20 seconds to have a look at this is this enough for a win after all of that let's have a look at the game continu continuation rook a a1 the rook comes back <clears throat> king g7 and now we see the move king c3 actually maybe the king is going for a walk across the dark squares potentially maybe bishop g6 the bishop is not doing anything it's it's biting granite as they say waiting rook f2 bishop h5 h3 there might be an interest in playing g4 bishop g6 rook a f1 a5 white just waits with king d2 Rook d8. White has got access to the f6 square, which he uses now. Rook d e8. And now, a very, very powerful move, spelling out how black is going to be mopped up here without any counterplay. Can you see the final move of the game, which causes black to basically positionally resign based on principle? And he's just going to be destroyed here. So, white's play. So what does white play which causes black to resign? Can you, can you see a nice move 
to put even more pressure on black and think oh I should resign here Any ideas? The final move of the game? Putting pressure now with rook d6. Good if you guessed this. The idea to double here. Black can't parry the F file black actually resigned here if he tries to parry the F file then we can simply just take the rooks the bishops hanging so this other rooks coming to F6 the knight controls E6 can't defend like that well, I can also also enjoy playing G4 it's it's torture for black it's a, it's a completely lost position there's absolutely no counterplay here Let's, let's say black plays this, just waiting for doom. Rook f6, bishop h7, h6 drops off. And then you've got things like g4. Let's, let's just carry on for a bit. g4, king, king g8. We can just simplify everything off like a mathematical formula. We could take with the rook or the knight. It's, it's hopeless this this sort of position is just doomed the knight stands much better than the bishop so it seems strategically from the opening it was a super polite opening and I definitely I have two people in, in my club um, Alex and Roy who discuss openings which seem really really dull and this this looks like one of the sort of things they'd enjoy because it's a way of of even if you're playing against a super super strong im or gm if you have this sort of opening you know what counterplay did black have it's a dream the opening is is a positional player's dream what happened in this game getting that knight versus bishop and then black is the one that just created weaknesses and lost maybe black could have put up a better resistance so yes a fantastic positional game which positional players i think will, will admire so this is one of the key games of wang yu so this is a round one i believe game so let's have a look at some more games uh, does anyone ha we have a quick look at that again so he accepted the double pawns and his strategy became concerns with these central squares and the dark squares just getting that knight to d4 strategically he achieved a winning position and then started this infiltration to recall it and this was the final move it makes sense it really makes sense positionally well, let's look at another game <clears throat> now his opponent here in round three was none other than the, the Chinese champion the 16 year old superstar child prodigy Wei Yi how did he tame Wei Yi so this is like Petrosian against Tao or something this match Wang Yu was playing white, 2716. Wei Yi, 16 years old, 2724. Slightly higher rated. Knight f3 is the start. Wei Yi plays knight f6. So, Wei Yi, you must have no, uh, noticed the immortal game was celebrated across multiple YouTube channels, websites, media places. It, it, the Rucksack game was played by Wei Yi. How does he tame him? Let's have a look. C4. G6. So, so far with C4 here, we've avoided mainline Grunfield stuff. 
you'd think, you know, the Grunfield, quite tactical, because Sparrow used the Grunfield quite a lot. This is English opening territory again. Knight c3. Black pretends as though it's a bit Grunfieldy with d5. Actually, this move, is it good? Is it book? Actually, usually people play bishop g7 here. No, it's been played quite a lot, d5 or c5. But bishop g7 was the top move. So c takes d, knight takes d5. And this looks a little bit crazy now, perhaps. It's offbeat what he plays. Mysteriously offbeat, in fact. And Wei Yi has been doing this himself in some games. They play quite offbeat uh, moves early on. In this position, it seems actually the top move is Queen A4 check with about 1200 games. E4 looks a bit Grunfieldy. Queen B3, there's like 432 games. G3, 336. D461. This looks like a crazy idea what he played. He plays H4. You know, I think. He's been watching me play bullet chess or something with my h pawn attacks. What's this h4? Does he want to hack the black king up? Does he want to open up the h file and sack later on the h file? It's kind of positional the way it's followed up with. We see bishop g7. And now this is an idea which I just couldn't believe you know my two friends at the club they would love this stuff there's a particular i am i i'll keep it secret but they would have loved to have played this against the i am's grunfield and i always wondered why this is for months i've been wondering why why wouldn't they want to just hack up this i am but there's an idea here which you can get in grunfields okay and <laughs> it might take c3 how do you take back the knight? How to take back the knight? Vote now. And why? Why would? You, how would you take back this knight on c3? What would be your preference? <clears throat> yes, they, 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 this, this, this is an interesting thing. You're trying to get off the queens with D takes C3. It looks a little bit off, off strange. This is the sort of thing Alf Anderson, I think, when he turned positional would play. D takes. You invite the exchange of queens. Why would you want to do this? Well, actually, it turns out here, the king's got a nice square on c2. It's closer to the middle of the board compared to the black king, if black castles. This could be a long-term, you know, factor for end games. You, you haven't uh, got such a fragile center here the impact's taken out if, if you look at the central construction with um with taking an nd4 black's always got sniping moves like c5 yeah on the center here it seems the center there's nothing to attack on d4 you haven't offered that target of attack on d4 so explicitly and uh, the bishop might be quite good on the diagonal and the light squares wait he played b6 and we have bishop f4 already causing some pressure on the queen side. Bishop b7. And instead of defending this pawn, if he just tries to defend it, yes, that's okay. But he, I think he played one of the better moves, which is this annoying check. So black's got to be careful here. He can't just... Uh, I don't think he can just do a move like this. 95 might be... Giving, giving white a small edge. He plays uh, c6. The bishop just goes to e2 here. Knight d7. You see, yeah, white's white's center is is 
In effect, white center is more solid than if the pawns are on c3 and d4. And the king here is, in effect, better for the end game. King c2. So you might think, like the previous game, is this the most boring player you've ever seen that I'm going over? Why would, why would anyone in their right mind want to play this position with white? Where, where's the advantage of the first move gone? Well, black already, he's a young opponent. He starts playing very, very committal moves. He wants to play aggressively. He plays a forcing move way e e5. Potentially, it's fixing down the bishop. Potentially, it's it's another liability for this bishop later on the light squares to be to be even stronger. But anyway, bishop drops back, controlling c5 now. Black plays c5, potentially weakening a few more light squares. Knight d2, and black plays very aggressively. This is the point, to play very aggressively with f5. And it looks as though, yeah, surely black's position has, has something going for it. The double fianchetta, the pressure on, on white. He's threatening immediately to trap the bishop, by the way. So something has to be done about that, let alone the pawn. So f3 supports the pawn and makes sure the bishop's not getting trapped. Knight f6, and then we see bishop d3. Little tricks here, you might think, well, there's pressure on e4. Has black got a little trick in c4? I don't think so. Just knight takes. We've got things like knight d6. Doesn't, doesn't really work out that well, knight d6. You don't want to do something like that, no. So black just castles. And now we see a4, which actually looks potentially strategically, well, not strategically, stru structurally destructive to get in this a5 not just extending the scope of the rook on the default position but causing some structural damage rook a c8 a5 white would love to get a rook to a7 black tries to close that down with b5 trying to deflect away from e4 here the pressure on e4 Okay, so in this position, let's have a quick look. Bishop takes, that doesn't work, surely. F takes is okay. Yeah, almost. Should be okay for black. But uh, also you might notice this pawn. W what is this with this pawn? Why can't we just take this pawn? Actually, that is the engine choice to take the pawn here. The engine actually kind of likes that pawn. And if c4, bishop e4, this looks to be already... Uh, significantly better for white actually this position here this position here because if takes we get knight d6 again yeah we can take here this is better for white but anyway that, that wasn't played he takes his very very tempting move here surely but uh, he plays a6 bishop goes to a8 and again he takes f5 is tempting but he plays actually bishop takes, letting his e pawn go. So swapping it seems a center pawn for a flank pawn. Why would you want to do this? F takes. Well, he gets in this check. And now in this position, white plays h5. White is immediately threatening, by the way, h6 to trap this bishop. Something has to be done about this. As well as hg. Now, if black black actually took here, if he takes on h5, then knight takes e4 is comfortable for white. When I say like comfortable, if we look at this position, the bishop's kind of hemmed in, the pawns are isolated here. There's no real infiltration point. Uh, this pawn looks like a concern with knight f6, but actually rook h4 might be good. Or even rook a5. So black doesn't really want that position. He plays e takes f3. We have g takes f3. And here, actually, this, this is a threat that white has to try and put pressure on c5. If knight takes h5... You might think, well, what's the problem here? Okay, rook a5. That pawn is pretty fixed as a target. The bishop can't help the pawn. 
What does black do here? If takes, we're gonna be getting that pawn. This this is nice for white. This position apparently, engine evaluation, even though it's a pawn down, is given as better for white. This might have been white's idea that. This is quite dangerous, only two steps away. This is a target. This bishop is not helping matters with the a7 pawn. Uh, if we have a look at this position here, it looks kind of passive for black. Bishop d5, we're going to put more pressure on a7. Looks a bit passive. So that's interesting that white you know, is prepared to go into these sort of positions. I believe that's the idea. It looks like strange stuff. But uh, in fact, here, instead of knight takes h5, g takes h5 is played. And this idea repeats now, rook. No, pardon me, it doesn't repeat. The engine's crying out for rook a5 though. Rook h4 is played here. So white's quite interested in playing knight e4 just to block the bishop. Rook f8, and he blocks the bishop now. What is he playing for in this position? There's two things which are quite striking that this bishop's kind of hemmed in by its own pawns even if it was on that diagonal on that one but also this pawn is a target potentially this bishop's very nice black is theoretically a pawn up but the double pawns don't bode well don't, don't look very good knight takes f takes And we see now forcing him a bishop f6, which surely is going to win a center pawn for just the measly double pawn. Yes, this happens. Bishop d3 prepared to swap it off, otherwise, there's a disaster on h7. Black can't avoid this. So we have white going into an end game, a pawn down. The engine indicates white's better. How is this so? White's got a lot of pressure. He can play a nice blocking move, King C4, and then C5 looks very vulnerable. So although White's temporarily a pawn down, the position has been tamed. You know, Black's dynamic play has been tamed. The two bishops have been removed from Black. White's got a lot of pressure, not just on C5, but on H7 potentially. We see Rook E6, King C4. Yes, the King by contrast to the black king by virtue of the opening is an aggressive active piece here and what does black do about c5 dropping off he actually lets that go with this next move if he plays bishop e7 then white can pick on h7 switch attention to h7 with this move what does black do then big trouble in Little China. That was a great film, wasn't it? Big Trouble in Little China. Sorry, little joke. Okay, so the tournament, by the way, I looked on Google Maps on the chess base article, is, is actually played on this small island south, southern, very south of, of China. Fascinating geographical location to look up, by the way. Um, so rook c c6 black is losing this pawn but he's you know isn't he putting pressure on a6 bishop takes c5 can he take this pawn can, is he in a position to take this pawn or not the thing is white's going to pick on h7 surely if white if it takes it we just pick on h7 and we're going to get a good position here surely this didn't happen but this is a nice position for white there's a two to one pawn majority now as well. So anyway, you know, black didn't take on a6. Black played bishop e7. And white plays b4. So we're equal on pawns here. Bishop takes c5, b takes c5, but the king is much more aggressive. Than the black king and can even go into d5 without penalty soon black is reduced to helplessness the king can't come into the game here we, we just surely we just well 
I think we can just throw in a check. It's 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 not very helpful for the king. Uh, it's come in as trying to safeguard the h7 pawn. We have e4. Black is reduced to helplessness. This is really unpleasant. King d5. E3. The pawn isn't a fantastic distraction here. In fact, white encourages it to come along because he knows if he takes it, he's going to be distracting this rook. The king will just take on c6. e2, rook h2. Yes, come on then. Come on, queen it. No, it's no good to queen it. I'll just show you. Well, black played rook g6. Just to make that clearer. We just take. And we take on c6. Black didn't want to queen it. It's totally winning for white this position. The king's going to come potentially to b7. This, or this pawn. So black plays rook g6. This is already, this is like winning for, for white this position. So he's officially now pawn up after rook takes e2. Rook c8. Rook e5. Safeguarding king a bit more check a few spike checks rook b8 check king goes to c6 now check king c7 rook b3 and now plays white doesn't defend c3 white plays rook d1 he's going for the black king and in fact black resigned in this position why does black resign well, if he takes let's have a quick look at that rook d7 is threatening the check as, as an example say check here yeah, takes king b7 and we're so far with these past pawns they're just they're just winning these past pawns are just winning it's trivially it's a trivially won end game you see the, the rook on the seventh cutting the king as well so even if it's not mating it's it's just a winning ending after rook d1 uh, if we throw in um the check rook d7 again it's just a winning ending we can force a, a pair of rooks off and just get a trivially won rook and pawn ending So he's tamed the magician for the brilliancy game who's higher rated than him from what seems to be and i was thinking of doing a video on this on, on youtube and i think this is good material for such a video something called not the top 10 most aggressive openings i've already done that but the top 10 most obnoxious openings or the top 10 most boring openings but i think wang yu has the monopoly on such openings and this opening didn't give black any counterplay so even though they're boring they're silently aggressive he's been called the the silent assassin and you start to get a glimpse why why is he being called the silent assassin because black didn't get a nice comfortable grunfeld where he could attack white center no that's just fantasy even though millions of people have been playing the grunfeld with white having that center protect that's just fantasy you don't need to give black that. This is an Alf Anderson variation. Black didn't have much counterplay again, like the other game we saw. The counterplay was almost like zero, but white was heading, it seems, for an advantageous ending. He's setting up trump cards with his king position and the advanced pawn, that when simplification comes round and when the ending comes round, he's got all those trump cards ready. So the simplification, when we get to the end game, white's got the trump cards, white's got the aggressive king and the dangerous past pawns. It's a fantastic way of winning games without too much risk. It might be a bit dull, but it's a fantastic way of winning games. I think there's no argument there. What do you guys think? The silent assassin. So that was another very interesting game, I thought, positionally. So let's go on to look at another game. 
than the Tormund. So in round in round four he drew, by the way. In round two he drew. In round five he was playing another very dynamic, aggressive player in the form of Ding Liren, who actually plays even the King's Engine the Fence and is famous for being a real expert in the King's Engine the Fence. So let's see. Wang Yu is white against Ding Liren, who is even higher rated than Wei Yi. Ding Liren is 2749. So he's up against like a King's Engine specialist. Is he really going to enter his King's Engine? He actually did play d4. None of this English opening. He goes into King's Indian territory. Knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3, bishop g7, e4, d6. Classical so far. Historically, knight f3 is the most popular move. We have a subtle difference. Bishop e2, that's also pretty popular. Black castles. Knight f3, of course, transposing back, but he didn't. He played actually bishop g5. This is the Averbach variation. Yuri Averbach, named after Yuri Averbach. c5. d5. Where enjoys a space advantage. E6. Knight F3. E takes D5. Okay, how would you take this pawn back? C takes, E takes, or Knight takes. How to take on D5? How would you take on d5 here out of interest? I have seen it with e takes d5, which is super boring. And sorry, it was a trick question. <laughs> no, actually, he did make it kind of interesting here with C takes D5. But I have seen it with E takes D5. Just trying to be content with the space range. No, no, he did actually play C takes D5. Sorry, sorry. I was just trying to trick you. <laughs> He's not that boring. It's an exciting pawn structure out of the opening. And it's a bit Benoni-esque. Uh, if white can flood the center leg with E5, this would be... Uh, you know the classic recipe against this structure h6 bishop drops back g5 bishop g3 we have knight h5 knight d2 There's still a few games in live book here, by the way. Knight takes g3. Supposed to be about equal. hg. Knight d7. Knight c4. It looks a bit like a Bononi or transposition. Knight f6. a4. b6. Queen c2. Very Benoni esque position. Rookie eight, white castles. A6. Rook FE1. White's preparing. The, the break for white was is in principle E5 here, which sometimes gets a dangerous pass pawn. Sometimes it also fractures black's pawn structure. Rook B8. We have knight E3 now. And yes, it seems comfortable enough for white here and, and okay for black. Queen e7. So black is threatening to snap off that pawn that's protected. We have h5, super aggressive move from Ding Liren. And you'll notice that is a feature of his aggressive counterparts. At some point, 
they're tempted to aggressively use their pawns. And I know this full well from my own games that aggressive dynamic players often win or lose games from the reckless or the brave use of pawns, depending on how you look at it. Is this a reckless abuse of pawns, use of pawns, abuse of pawns? h5 what is it doing is he he wants to smash white up with knight g4 or h4 white now it seems plays energetically once this pawn move is played he breaks in the center with e5 a pawn sack okay what's the problem here with say queen takes e5 it's actually more subtle than you think. If there's a knight move, I think queen takes e1 is very, very good for black. So it's not like that. That that would be falling into black's hands, in fact. This position is much better for black, it seems. No, no, that's not the idea. This position, this, this didn't happen with queen takes e5. The engine suggests actually just <laughs> playing calmly queen d2. Um, what does black do here? Same moves here. We got knight c2. That's pretty good. Sorry, queen here. Knight f5. We dangerous. Yeah, that starts to get dangerous after just silent move queen d2 for knight f5 or knight c2. Uh, and if black has to do something like this, this position is starting to justify that pawn sack. it's white's got nice control nice pressure here for the pawn sack so yeah black didn't want to take with his queen he took with the pawn which has got its own downsides while it's getting potentially useful past pawn here in the center he also gets a nice blockade on the e5 pawn which he uses immediately knight e4 immediately d6 looks very dangerous we have knight g4 if instead knight takes e4 i think white would enjoy a nice grip on the light squares here this bishop like in the the other game we've just seen is, is not too healthy looking but anyway knight g4 was played and we have this running pawn potentially but that's not played knight takes g4 first and now d6 so what is this pawn sack about is it just about getting an aggressive pawn on d6 well, actually, he gets his pawn back anyway, with bishop takes a6. Where did that come loose? White's, White's got his pawn back. And it seems with advantage. <clears throat> Could black have avoided that? Hold on a sec, just rewind for a moment. This position. If he had kept in the pawn intact, that, I don't think this is too happy for black this position anyway move queen d2 the targets the pawn justifies the pawn sack i think it's double pawns anyway it's measly double pawns anyway so anyway so a6 was taken so we're equal on pawns at the moment and why it's gonna if given a move play bishop c4 pinning down f7 so f5 is used very aggressive isn't that just winning the d6 pawn once well, got this in hand with the move f3 counter-attacking the bishop we have f takes f takes g4 queen takes d6 the queen's hit h6 g takes h5 so opposite color bishops we have e3 is that a setting little trap i think it is if rook takes e3 maybe e4 is useful But um, even so, this is okay for white anyway, it seems, technically. But he doesn't want to get involved in that. He blocks that bishop. 
by blocking the pawn. And now some simplification. He locks down the position. He can take this pawn at leisure. He's locking down the position. And it's dangerous. Black has got to be wary about his back row here. If he plays something like rook d4, I think this back row is annoying. This, that's not very nice. You, there's even this check, because you know we've got things like this. So yeah, he doesn't want to do that. He, he plays queen f6, rook f1, rook d4. Finally, he takes here, rook f4. B3 taking the pawns onto line squ squares away from the bishop. Bishop's protecting f1 by the way. Queen d8. Now rook takes f4, simplifying further. If e takes, this might be tempting, it seems, to open up the bishop, but actually this position is quite dangerous for black here. Very dangerous. I want to avoid this. He actually took with this pawn, which of course we've got potential pawn mobility. Queen d3, wanting the queens off. Check, 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 check. And he's getting his wish. He's getting the queens off here. And how do you assess this position? Draw or win? Draw or win? Opposite color bishops? A lot of you might think, oh, opposite color bishops is a draw. It's a draw, opposite color bishops. Well, let's see what happens in this concrete position. Something fascinating did happen. Which I think will we'll put it into a classic opposite color bishop endgame case study. A classic case study for what happened. King f2, check. King g5, bishop e2, bishop e1, king e4, bishop c3, defending the pawn, bishop b4. Why did he have to let the pawn go? Why does he have to let the pawn go? If he stays around on the pawn, then king d5, this, this starts to be troublesome, doesn't it? He stays around there, king e6. Actually, this king is threatening to come around here and help the pawn queen. We can't stay around here because this is like winning this position here, even this position. So we've got things like we're actually winning here with this pawn. If you treat the position on its own merits, you'll see that the pawn actually in this particular position is winning. This this bishop's just silly. So coming back here, it seems as though he's letting the pawn go for good reason, because this king's not necessarily going over here, as you might think, as I initially, to be honest, thought. But the king might actually be sneakily aiming to blockade the e pawn and go around here and guide this pawn to either give it up for this pawn. With that bishop unable to do anything about h8 that's a very nasty plan for an endgame that's a sinister endgame plan this is the silent assassin black again like the other two opponents hasn't been given too much counterplay in this game and we're faced with such a, an unbelievably ridiculously undefendable plan i mean seriously so if he did just stick around here, I'll just show you that again in slow motion. White just blockades e4 against e4, so the bishop's stuck. 
and then he's just basically losing this by force after king e6 the bishop is stranded if we go over here this is hopeless we're queening g7 queening so anyway i'm hoping you will convince that um oh blimey the pawn had to be dropped that's a bit unfortunate is it the end of the world it's opposite color bishops check at least the bishop now has got access to h8 so these guys are not going anywhere right bishop d2 king c6 bishop a5 now this next plan caught the attention of a grandmaster who tweeted about it it's unbelievable unbelievable it's sick it's like one of the sickest plans i've ever seen in an opposite color bishop ending white play the engine has some other ideas about it though but here white play what would you play as white what would be the plan white play it's a really really sick idea that he comes up with sick even used in the positive term of sick you know, as in brilliant plays bishop d1 okay so if the bishop moves we win this so the king moved and now can you see what white plays white play here <laughs> it's sick imprisons that bishop if the bishop takes then king takes and we're going to be playing a5 that's going to be nasty so the pawn takes but now he imprisons the bishop of the king g5 king d5 the king is free to get over here and black resigns if he ever plays b5 then this b pawn will be winning it'll be costing the bishop black's helpless here he resigned as an example king h6 we just go over here say the king says we win that pawn we're going to just herd the pawns the bishop's also looking at g8 by the way very usefully this bishop's not looking at anything If black ever plays the freeing move b5 then white just goes to win the bishop later with uh, b6 and the king's stuck can you never take here because of this guy the king's stuck yeah so black again can't use his king's will queen here and if he keeps moving his bishop here then we just get our king over here and that's it I think just here be simple enough we just queen winning so yeah who says opposite color bishop endings are a draw it really depends on the position this is the beauty of chess we can make up all these generalizations but this seems to be quite a vicious plan if you think black can get out of this because it's opposite color bishops I think you're wrong the engine evaluation is plus 6.55 what do you guys think are opposite color bishop endings drawn this really depends on the position that's the only answer to such questions
Wow, so how does he get these openings? <laughs> he did actually play the opening in a very exciting way there. Uh, the E5 break was quite interesting. It created a pass pawn. Let's look at that in slow motion again. What exactly happened there again? From a King's Indian to Benoni. Then there was a timely E5 break, which did something strange or not. It's kind of thematic, it's known as thematic break, but it was in reaction to the seemingly rash or aggressive looking pawn move. Maybe knight g4 was on the card layer. So e5, taking away the e5 square from black's pieces, because sometimes black is enjoying the e5 square in Benoni. White's enjoying the e4 outpost square. We get some simplification out of it. And it, tra it goes now after f5 into an opposite it's heading towards that opposite color bishop ending if f5 hadn't been played then bishop c4 it looks like a, an unpleasant position for black here bishop b5 this looks like an unpleasant position for black here if he had gone for this it looks beautiful with the past pawn not even tear down it looks like a very pleasant position so the e5 break seems to be um, profoundly powerful and not for an immediate tactical concern or refutation because black would be prepared to give up the queen for the rook here if we move here we've got queen takes e1 but no i think this more silent queen d2 is the engine suggestion here from fritz uh, with the idea that knight c2 or knight f5 this this is unpleasant for black this sort of position so yeah the e5 break i'm looking at that because that's the dynamic pawn sack move in the game and this would rebound this h5 it would rebound back fire on black so yeah e5 does seem to be in principle if the opponent does uh, what seems to be you know a rash weakening move sometimes if you sack a pawn you you can expose weaknesses which weren't intended to be exposed but here it, it seems you know white's trump card as well the center pawn um is, is created but no we, we transpose into this opposite color bishop and pawn ending in the game continuation and he gets the queens off with this multitude of checks here he eventually gets the queens off by force and then we get this imprisoned dark square bishop because you notice all the pawns are on dark squares anyway statistically in the king's engine you often end up with a lot of pawns on dark squares uh, so yeah, it's it's this imprisonment of the bishop was tweeted by a GM as being quite impressive. Um, I've forgotten which GM, but yeah, someone tweeted about it as well. A lot of people have thought this is quite impressive, this imprisonment of the bishop. So we learn positional play from Wang Yu. We learn positional play, it seems, from these three games. I don't know about you guys. Are you getting some positional play ideas? So we'll go on. An impressive tournament so far. Now, he played black in round six against the person involved in the Immortal recently, against Lazaro Bruzon Batista. Let's have a quick look at that game. <clears throat> So we're going to flip the board. He was playing black in round six. I'm so happy Fritz hasn't crashed. It's better to use Fritz if it's not going to crash than whatever, isn't it? <laughs> so we've still got the board. It's good. No major technical issues touching wood. Okay, we're into round six. Lazaro Bruzon Batista, who was on the receiving end of the Immortal in this tournament, which raised the profile of the entire tournament, really, that Immortal game. Which is why I'm even actually looking at the tournament, in fact. Um, so interestingly, so E4 from Batista, who's 2669, so he's a visiting GM. So E5. So most of the GMs in the tournament are Chinese. Bruzon Batista. He was born in Cuba. He's been long long time Cuba's number two player behind Lenia Domingue Pere. Okay, so, okay, let's see. Knight to f3, knight f6. 
Dull. Dull. Petrov's opening defense. Knight takes e5. d6. Knight f3. Knight takes e4. d4. Very trodden territory. d5. Bishop d3. Knight c6. Is this the most popular move? Just checking with library. Yes, it's the most popular move. Castles. Bishop e7. Rookie one. Bishop g4, this is the most trodden move. 618 games here. I don't think it's any good to try and win a pawn here. We'll just I'll just show you that. White didn't try and win a pawn or anything here. Uh, the most usual move is either c3 or c4 in this position. Just in case you really wanted to increase your Petrov opening theory. If you take here, this is very rarely played only five games compared to hundreds if you t if you take on e4 but I'm going to answer that question here black just plays takes on f3 then takes on d4 and black shouldn't have too many problems the pawn structures definitely dull symmetrical black shouldn't have any problems here right so after bishop g4 we have the move c4 putting some pressure on this outpost knight undermining its roots like a weed knight f6 game back a bit knight c3 ah interestingly hold on usually white plays c takes d5 here actually but anyway knight c3 has been played before and usually black plays bishop takes f3 here which is given usually as a small advantage for white for example bishop takes this position is often ending in an, an interesting position for white with some initiative so but anyway yeah knight takes d4 was played instead of bishop takes f3 which might be a very crafty opening move actually it's it's slightly rarer only 13 games compared to 72 but it seems to offer equality knight takes d4 here uh, over those games c takes d5 bishop takes doubling white's pawns protecting the knight hmm, we have d6 maybe this wasn't the best this pawn sack could have been a bit rash the engine is suggesting something different with a smaller range for white check here yeah instead we have this pawn sack d6 should black be terrified is king still in the center isn't this really dangerous well he takes it knight b5 he takes that bishop takes yes his king's inconvenienced but he's a pawn up right and he's also damaged white's pawn structure so if he's not getting mated it can't be that bad queen e2 queen c7 bishop f4 trying to deflect the queen away from e7 yeah bishop d6 bishop takes queen takes rook ad1 queen drops back queen e3 engine evaluation is slightly better for black here by about nearly half a pawn by the way a6 which may fall h5 though maybe the rook's coming out oh rook d5 rook c8 rook e5 and actually there's been an evaluation shift in white's favor here it seems white is actually threatening uh rook e8 mating here all these guys are conspiring for rook e8 to be checkmate by the way so something has to be done about that you do see that's checkmate right if b6 rook e8 is mating yeah 
So yeah, something has to be done about that. So we see the move B5, okay. But we get an invasory move, Rook E7. Possibly, okay, there's other moves, Bishop C2, which which could, could actually be dangerous here, it seems. Because white is threatening Rook E7. And if G6, trying to put the king here, apparently Bishop takes here is, is dangerous. This position is, is, is very interesting for white. For example, here it's a disaster, I think, Queen E5. But yeah, he didn't do that. He didn't do Bishop C2. Maybe that's that's technically the best move here to play Bishop C2. If ever G6, then yes, there's some tactics going on. But he played actually Rook E7, Queen B8, Bishop B3. So he has to be done about this one. C4, Bishop C2. Now rook h6 is possible. Forget uh, g6. I think that's still asking for bishop takes g6. That's just end of game, in fact. If you want to play like that, you just, you just get mated. It's a forced mate. Whatever. So no, no g6. No g6 here. Rook h6. Rook a7. Threatening a mating free with check and then mating over here. Knight d5 protecting e7, hitting the queen. This might have been a bit of a. Um, pardon me. Technically, it seems as though this gave away the advantage, by the way, technically to black after this, this continuation with rook d8. Black seems to be, from the engine point of view, doing very, very well. We're talking plus two here now queen h4 king g8 so black seems to have consolidated to be a real pawn up not only that white with this miserable pawn structure rook b7 trying to deflect the queen away queen d6 black's central position he's got no problem pieces um Actually, better might have been Queen C8 though. But anyway, here at Rook D1, we see Queen F8, King H1, Rook HD6. Black's coordinated quite nicely now. Rook G1. But White maybe is optimistic here. Hold on. What what about all this pressure here? And what about this pawn as well? Why don't we just take this pawn? If you take that pawn, knight f6 hits the queen and hits d1. And that's end of game. Yeah, you can't take that pawn. So we see rook g1, knight f6, a4. Well, black, if given time, will play rook d2, just starting to hit things. So we see... Um, So let me explain that as well, because you might be thinking, oh, King's Cross doesn't know what he's talking about because there's Queen F6, right? Well, actually, yeah, I think there's some other tactical points, though. White plays A4, right? Let's just have a quick look in this position. Rook D2 might actually be um, possible here. If, if Queen F6, well, actually, we can take on C2. But even if we didn't, I think there's always... Um, Now, there's, there's rook takes c2 at, at, at minimum anyway so anyway what white tries to sort of dismantle black's pawn chain here with a4 so b takes a4 bishop takes a4 king h8 we're approaching move 40 well i think they'll get extra time Queen takes c4 so it's as if yeah white's been mildly successful he's he's damaged you know black's pawn chain he's got rid of it on the queen side rook d4 queen drops back knight d5 maybe black wants to play something like this and target d6 
I mean use d6 Bishop c6 we see King g8 here and actually that is also to be honest that's also the engine's top move and I wonder why um, if, if we have a move like well it's protecting f7 I think the problem is if Queen d6 I think f7 will drop potentially in in these variations white takes on d5 first and then we'll take on f7 so king g8 is actually a nice safeguarding move not to drop f7 so yes yes just king g8 safeguarding f7 bishop takes d5 rook 4 takes d5 queen c4 Queen d6, yes. All of black's pieces are nicely centralized now. Queen c3, but uh, threatening mate. g6. Queen b3, and it looks as though if there's going to be a pin on this one, then rook g6 is going to be annoying. We see queen f4. Yeah, queen f5 would be nice, maybe. To protect g6. Rook b6. We see a5, rook g3, king h7, queen c3 setting up what seems to be a very lucrative tactic now. Off the rook f5, the queen seems to be on a dangerous diagonal here. Is there some conspiring of these guys on the black king? Rook c6, this isn't move 46. We see queen d2 here, which is actually a good move, it seems. White gets a bit overexcited here. It's a very creative move. I mean, it'd be great if it had worked. Can you guess, can you guess what white had played? So white's play here, he gets excited. White is excited and plays what? Can you guess? Is there a kind of weakness of the last move apparently? Because where was the queen? The queen was here. Okay, it goes to d2. What does white play? Any ideas? I think he's in a bad position here anyway. He really doesn't want to exchange queens, right? It's a bit of a desperate position. That, that would just be horrible, wouldn't it? He's just losing another pawn. That would be miserable. If he protects this pawn, it's again kind of miserable. You're going to take here next. Well, anyway, he tries his luck with um, rook g takes g6, right? Uh, so the point being is he seems to have this check available, and also if takes, then that's there's a check here, which is nearly mating. Rook d7, queen takes d2. Yeah, this this even this though is technically it's okay for black, but um, no. Black does much better than taking. Black plays the check, seemingly allowing this intermediate opportunity of playing the check. Unfortunately, there's a small snag to this whole thing. There's a very unfortunate snag here after king g7. B takes c3. Uh, can you guess what black plays here? Uh, black to play. It's actually the final move of the game. It's it's a uh, quite a significant problem.
All right, actually, so one of you said Rook G5, two of you said F6 so far. Rook G5 is interesting. Maybe, maybe, maybe White was thinking that would play Rook G5. That's that's very interesting. As, as though this is a, a mating threat, and this is this is what. But here, White can actually play this and be okay. No, the more significant problem is this F6 because this rook is just munched this rook is just lost ouch it's it's it's, a, it's not funny is it it's not funny but the rook stranded it was it was a bad position anyway it's not as if it was in a vacuum as as nigel short says you know when you look at mistakes they're not in a vacuum he, he was in a difficult position anyway mistakes are, are not in a vacuum usually And actually, now that you mentioned Rook G5, maybe you know Black was banking on. Sorry, White was was thinking that Black would try and refute it with this Rook G5, and then he's got this, and is is actually he's actually equal here. He would actually be equal, so that would be something to celebrate if he got to this position. But no, unfortunately, uh, yeah, F6 just wins the Rook. Yeah, so if you want to play really dull opening with Black. It's called the Petrov. I think it is one of the most boring openings of all time. The Petrov uh, defense, and he didn't seem to have any problems out of the opening. And in fact, he inflicted basically structural damage. White sacks a pawn for some what seems to be a temporary inconvenience. White's major tactical opportunity seems to have been actually to have played bishop c2 if there's an improvement here engine suggests this is actually almost an advantage for white this position of the bishop c2 but unfortunately he didn't do that he kind of got um bad made a bad sorry he made a bad position worse um yeah he, he set that pawn his position it seems as though black was kind of getting back into things a pawn up and um, yeah the final little tactical try fails okay let's go on to another game uh, the, the last one I want to look at in this tournament was against Wang Shen this was in round seven it's his last decisive game. Around eight and nine, he drew. So let's have a look at the Wang Shen game. So he was white against Wang Shen. So sharing the first name of his opponent. <laughs> um, so we've got the two Wangs. Battle of the Wangs. Wang Yu against Wang Shen. Okay, he's playing white against Wang Shen. So knight f3, d5. We have g3, e6, bishop g2, g6. Let's get past the opening. d4, bishop e7, knight e7, knight bd2. Okay, so what opening is this? What would you categorize it as? It's kind of ready opening. Castles, e4, b6, rook e1. Bishop b7. White gets a nice strong hold on the e5 square in this game. After e5. It's a nice strong point e5. c5, c3. a5. Knight f1. And there's a lot of Fisher games in the cool spring, you know, with this kind of stuff. You're trying to maybe exchange off dark square bishops probe these dark squares you use your spearhead square control that e5 black hasn't got too much counterplay knight bc6 knight e3 he plays black plays h6 in advance here white's white's threatening kind of virtually knight g4 so h6 in advance so i guess now the point is king h7 if knight g4 this wasn't played 
Oh no, hang on. No, no, black's got either king h7. Well, that is a possibility, or knight f5. But anyway, white actually played h4 here. C takes. C takes. Bishop a6. Wang Shen, by the way, is 2521. Um, I'll just check for you if he's a GM or an IM. Wang Shen, he's a, he was an IM in. in 2011 born 1993 he's an IM so a3 just in case black was thinking of popping the knight to d3 by b4 <clears throat> beef b3 you put in bishop here later Bishop h3, knight g4. Pressure is starting to be felt on the dark squares. Bishop f4. And we can build pressure now on h6 with queen d2. Got a nice tar target here. Rook c8, queen d2. a4. Yeah, what, are, what else does Black do? He played a4. He could try and keep solid, but I don't know. White's, is White brewing something up? Okay, anyway, let's go with the game. He played a4. So the idea, it would seem, would be to get the c4 square. You have to sack a pawn to put a knight onto c4. So knight a5. Or knight b3 is immediately threatening to win the exchange. We have rook eb1. One slight problem is... This pawn might be vulnerable, believe it or not. Knight c4, queen d1. Queen e7. Knight e3. So I is actually threatening to take this knight off and win b6 here. Queen a7 protecting b6. Knight g4, bishop b7. Bishop f1. Bishop c6. Rook b4 protecting that pawn. Rook f d8. Bishop d3. The bishop's nice on this diagonal now. White actually is threatening h5 to try and break black's king side up. And you can imagine after hg we've got moves like king g2 and maybe using this, this h file on h6. We see bishop f8. And here in fact white doesn't bother about losing the exchange. He carries on with h5. It, it, it's so lucrative to try and smash black's king side up here so what about the exchange black takes the exchange he's weakening his king in doing so a little bit as well the dark square protection a takes this is like nearly plus two from an engine perspective in those exchange down it's like Look at Black's king. He's only got the knight as the defender. We've got one, two, three, potentially four, potentially this h file as well. So it's pretty good attacking pressure. Knight b2, h takes, f takes. Okay, white to play here. What white to play here? Can you can you guess what white plays in this position? Any ideas? White to play here. Who's awake? White to play. Anyone? You want to move your queen? You want to move your queen? If you move your queen it's still good for white but even better is bishop takes g6 because this is a loose piece guy guys it's a loose piece loose pieces drop off with double attacks so takes check taking it yeah there's only one pawn now sheltering black king 
uh, the queen goes to try and help things out over there if bishop takes that i really don't think that's a good idea queen d2 this this is oh not very good that doesn't really help to have a pinned piece added to it so yeah queen f7 queen d2 threatening bishop takes h6 good compensation for the exchange the knights protect each other and white can actually play on the queen side here as well with a past a pawn on the horizon now bishop e8 knight e3 queen h3 white was also potentially playing king g2 here to guard h3 and maybe that h file later is is good with knight f3 and rook h1 so we see here black depriving white at least of king g2 to try and get the rook round but a5 the rook is also happy to push a past pawn here saying basically to play, well i'm not that desperate to immediately mate you to prove that i've got enough compensation for being the exchange down it's like the exchange down for two pawns here and i'm creating a fantastic potentially fantastic past a pawn now b takes b takes she's got an a pawn which she now pushes to a6 so it's stretching back on this side again rook a8 knight g2 and potentially this is getting nasty with this one going there this one going here something naughty is happening here on the king side that would shield h6 so immediately this battery would be more important if knight h4 is played so we see the queen escaping to keep protection on h6 g4 queen g6 bishop g3 now and now knight f4 is a nuisance rook here knight f4 black plays this check Uh, if he doesn't well I think he's doomed anyway here he's got to protect e6 as well you yeah, know if he plays here then I think we've got knight takes and it's getting horrible so um he plays this check and he actually takes on a1 giving up his queen yeah this it's not much else now um knight takes bishop takes so he gives up his queen or at least black's getting this pawn as well though it seems so is black getting mated here bishop h4 rook a7 check king h7 queen b4 threatening the knight again among other things queen b8 is also dangerous for queen h8 mate and also hitting the rook knight g8 defending against that sort of stuff knight f3 there's too much pressure on black here are the rooks really coordinating against the queen remember white in the audit trial of material exchanges in this game white had given up the exchange black has taken the opportunity to get a rook and a piece a minor piece not you know knight and bishop for, for the queen so that's why we've ended up in the equation here with two rooks against the queen. White's well, got an extra pawn at the moment on the king side, even though this pawn's taken. And the king safety in the dark squares in particular still seem vulnerable. White's well, got the dark square bishop. We have rook one takes a6. So it's like two rooks against the queen, but are the rooks coordinating well enough to defend this position? Knight h4. Bishop d3, King g3, Rook c6, Knight g2. So that looks good for Knight f4 to get back with a vengeance over there. Bishop c2, Knight f4. Black doesn't last very long from here. He's, he's pretty overloaded he's pretty overloaded because white has two key dark square threats queen f8 and queen b8 all the time which look pretty menacing 
We have rook f7. The bishop's not going anywhere. f3 is played. So why is this? Uh, knight, knight takes wasn't played. If knight takes, e takes, rook takes, then there's check. The knight is controlling g6. And so the rook's just dropping off here. So that's not possible. We have rook fc7 trying to keep things solid. But now this invasory move queen f8 is quite destructive on the dark squares. Black's kind of paralyzed here. I think he tries rook a6 and now this next move shows that although white's got a strong dark square grip in theory with the dark square bishop it's the other color complex which is really the straw which breaks the camel's back here white's play here can you see the final move of the game white's play And it ends the game. Black doesn't find a defense after this next move. He has installed basically quite a few attacking pieces around the king. And these are almost like attacking pieces. But what is what is the move that finishes Black off in this position? Actually, it's a very good position anyway. There are probably other moves that win. I'll, I'll just show you, I think. Uh, queen, queen e8 was played. Okay, black's actually controlling g6. It's not that. It's to do with e6. e6 is a pain to try and defend. If e6 drops, then that's it. e6 is, is the big issue here. But there's also another issue in g5 as well for g6 mating so these two issues combined mean black hasn't got the fence if he tries to defend e6 here then i think we just well queen f7 is chatmate um that's another problem uh okay let's just just move this one for a laugh in fact even stronger than knight takes which is really quite crushing is actually g5 here threatening g6 and if hg queen h5 here knight h3 is 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 destructive for black's king uh so yeah it's it's an overload here after queen e8 so dual threats knight e6 and g5 so queen yeah, yeah black had enough here it, the white king is very very safe and cozy here against the two rooks there are some positions the two rooks are quite good compensation but not here for the queen it's all mixed in with king safety for both sides and the installed attacking pieces as well which are quite well entrenched in this position for white so yeah he he um i don't think he lost a single game in this tournament when you hang on no let me just check that did he lose i don't think when you lost he had some draws he had one two three four draws and on if you look on 2700chess.com yeah i don't know if any of you visit 2700chess.com He's the big mover and shaker. He's ranked 22 in the world now on that, gaining 19.6 points from this tournament. So he only had some draws and some wins. He gained, that's a huge amount of rating points at his level to get to rank 22 now in live ratings after this tournament. I didn't go over the draws because that would really stretch this out. So I thought it'd be nice to go over the wins to get a glimpse of this amazing positional player i don't know if you guys got anything from this i hope you did i think i did because i like to study positional players sometimes it's a nice uh, balanced diet so, so you know, study the positional players study the attacking players 
you never know you know you can use different styles against different opponents etc or your mood okay i hope you enjoyed that and see you next week okay so this will go on youtube comments or questions on youtube thanks very much see you next week